Hi, welcome back to The Distressed Princess. I'm Rhonda and in today's video, I'm counting down my top 12 favorite farmhouse DIYs. So grab a glass of sweet tea and maybe pop some popcorn, settle in and stay until the end so you find out what my very favorite farmhouse project is so far. DIY number 12. I had picked up these two pieces of artwork on clearance at TJ Maxx, a large piece that was missing its glass and a smaller piece that I thought was just really cute. And I thought I could combine the two to make one really unique large piece. So the first thing I'm going to do is remove the backing and the inside mat that I may use for something else at another time. The plan is to make a shiplap backing and I'm just going to paint right on to the backing of this piece. But if you didn't want to do that, you could put a poster board or a foam board and paint that instead. But I'm just using the backing and at first I started painting this way and then I realized, you know, my shiplap is going to be running the other direction. So then I changed direction. I always think about that. Um, when you're going to put shiplap, which way your planks are running and paint that direction. And this is the way I always do my shiplap lines. I want to start in the middle. So I'm measuring the piece and it was uh, almost 20 inches. And so the middle point would be almost 10 inches. And that's where I'm going to make my first line. So I'm going to measure out the 10 inches and then I put a little dot where that is and then I'm going to use that dot to draw my first line. Now regular ruler wasn't big enough so I'm using a gallon size or one of the large size paint sticks to go by to make my line. Then I wanted these planks to be three inches apart so then I just measure out three inches from the first line, make a dot and draw my second line and it just goes on and on just like that. To blend those uh, Sharpie lines in, I go back over with a little bit of dry brush, uh, the same white paint I used to paint the backboard, which by the way was Rust-Oleum linen white chalk paint. Another thing I like to do to make my shiplap look a little more authentic is go back and add a few little lines that are not quite perfect. Then replace the backing and secure it into place and you're ready to put the other decoration on the front. If you're wanting to recreate this at home, they often have clearance picture frames at Hobby Lobby for dirt cheap because they're missing their glass or they're a little bit damaged in some little place where you can fix it up. So you can find these frames there really inexpensively. And also this other decoration that I found at TJ Maxx, you could find lots of cute options at uh, Dollar Tree even. They have a lot of newer, nice looking pieces that you can combine with uh, a picture frame just like this and make your own. Okay, so back to the project. This little decoration had a bracket on the back for hanging on the wall, which I removed, just uh, pop the screws out. You saw I used a little <laughs> a steak knife because it's the perfect size for those little tiny screws. And now I'm going to use that fix all adhesive to, uh, oh, and hot glue as well for the immediate hold to glue this right in the center of the picture frame. This turned out being one of my very favorite farmhouse projects that I've done so far because of the simplicity of it. It didn't take very much effort and it didn't take very much money and it made a huge impact on my walls. Here 
Here comes number 11. This is a jar that I got at the Dollar General store and it was clearance 50% off. So I only paid $1.50 for it. It's really cute the way it is, but you know me, I have to make it rustic farmhouse. So my first order of business was to remove the pink and gold Be Happy. I used Goo Gone from the Dollar Tree to try to loosen it. And then I used my trusty razor scraper from the Dollar Tree to scrape the design off. And it all worked very well. The glass didn't get scratched or anything. It worked perfectly. And I used the Goo Gone and my scraper to get the sticky label off of the bottom of the jar as well. Next, you'll want to wash and dry your jar because we're going to use a rub-on transfer and I'm not certain that it would work if it still had any of that Goo Gone still on the glass. Okay, this is the most fun out of all the DIYs today is these rub-on transfers that you get at the Dollar Tree. And I liked the whole bottom floral part. So I'm gonna use that whole bottom floral part to put on this jar. And it's really easy to use these transfers. First, just cut out the piece of the transfer that you want to use. Then get an idea of where your placement is going to go on the jar. Next, peel the backing away from the transfer and you're ready to place it on your jar, but be careful, don't let it touch the jar until you're certain that's where you want it to go. Because if you try to move it now, you're going to ruin your design. I learned this the hard way uh, on another DIY. So once you get your transfer put onto the jar, then smooth it out. And you can use a credit card, a Kroger card. In my case, <laughs> I didn't want to go hunt for any kind of a card to burnish it on. So I'm using the back end of my razor scraper. Then slowly peel the plastic back, making sure that all the pieces stay on the glass. And if there is a piece that's trying to come up, lay the plastic back down and rub it on some more and try again. I swear I want to put these rub-on transfers all over everything. Look how pretty and easy that was and oh, just so satisfying. Here's number 10. This cutting board that I got at Goodwill for $3 and it's really heavy. It's really chunky and heavy and I liked that about it. And I debated for a long time if I was going to leave this its natural color or if I was going to paint it. And if you're on the side that thinks that I shouldn't have painted it, I'm so sorry. But I decided it needed to be white. So I used Rust-Oleum chalk paint in linen white. I gave it just one coat so it looks kind of whitewashed a little bit. And then I used a 120 grit sandpaper to distress around the edges and it distressed so beautifully. This is the reason why I wanted it to be painted white because I had this ribbon that I found at the Dollar General. It was only $2 and it's so cute, don't you think? And even though I'm not a huge fan of red I just had to buy this so I knew I wanted to decorate with that ribbon and I also love grain sack stripes so I'm using this gray chalk paint from Michaels to put on some grain sack stripes now this is the easiest way to do the grain sack stripes on something like this and you could be precise you could get out a tape measure a ruler you know and measure out exactly what 
width you want these stripes to be and all of that but I just eyeballed it all and that worked out just fine for me as long as you think that the stripes are level that's that's the thing that's most important to me is that the stripes are running crooked so you might use a level if you're afraid that you might get your stripes crooked so then after I lay down the masking tape to make my stripes push down along the edges to minimize the bleeding of the paint under the tape and then I just did two coats of the chalk, the gray chalk paint. Before the chalk paint is dry, you wanna take your tape up while it's still wet. That way there's no peeling of your gray paint when you peel the tape up. The beautiful ribbon is going to go across the bottom of this cutting board and I'll just hot glue that down and wrap it around the back. And if you wanted it to go all the way around the back, I kind of wish I would have went all the way around the back so it would have a more finished look. But um, I guess I didn't want to use up all my ribbon and the back isn't going to be seen. So to save as much ribbon as I could, I just wrapped it a little bit around the back. You could stop right here and this would be a really cute decoration for your kitchen, but I wanted it to be functional. Since I took away its function as being a cutting board because I won't be able to cut on it, I decided to make it a recipe holder. And I had these curtain rings. You can get them a pack of, I think a pack of 10 at Walmart for just a, a few bucks, like $3. And I've just had them laying around and I want to use the clippies off of them. So I used my wire cutters to bend the little metal hook that's inside of them that attached the clippy to the ring. I just bent it and it was really easy to get that little clippy part off of the ring. I'm using two because they're so small that I felt like I needed two in order to make it look right. But if you don't have anything like this, if you don't have any clips or anything metal, I wanted metal, you could use clothespins, the small clothespins from Dollar Tree or regular size clothespin would be cute too. And you could, I would paint it black, but that's just my preference. I really love how this turned out with the stripes and the ribbon and the little black clips. And I love that it kept its functionality, even though it's not the same purpose it was made for. I think I like it even better. If you like this idea, remember to give me a big thumbs up, please. Look out for number nine. At my house, I always save the jars that my candles come in, so I usually have an abundance of them. And I'm going to use one in my first DIY today. My plan is to turn this empty candle jar into a juke string holder, so I need to drill a hole in the center of the lid. And I know that I got my drill bit a little off center, but I'm not gonna let that bother me. You guys pay more attention and actually <laughs> drill your hole in the center of the lid. Now, if you have something on the top of your lid, like wording wise, like mine came from Bath and Body Works, and I don't really want that to show through because it's embossed into the metal, um, just use spackle 
and spackle over any wording or any designs that you don't want to show on your candle lid. And then I hit mine with a hair dryer and it dried really fast on this metal lid and sand it back down and I liked to sand it completely smooth but the words were all filled in and so they won't be noticeable when you paint. I used my trusty Rust-Oleum chalk paint in linen white and gave the lid two good coats. And I wanted to make them very thick coats because I'm going to use the natural cracking of the chalk paint to distress this lid. So if you didn't know, if you use really thick coats of chalk paint and then you go over it with a heat gun or in my case, a really hot hair dryer, then the chalk paint naturally wants to separate and so you get like a crackling effect. And I like to do this sometimes when I don't have time or I don't want to mess with making any cracking medium. Now I'm going to age the lid even more by adding some black craft paint and just some little splotchy areas around the edge and also a few little spots on the top just to make it look like it's an old painted lid. It's been painted many times. This jar might have been used to hold all kinds of stuff out in the barn. And after all the paint is dry, the only thing left to do is to add the jute string. And I love this big chunky ball of jute string. I think it came from the Dollar Tree. You can find it there or Walmart or any craft supply store. But look how cute that is showing through this jar. Number eight is so cute. Now for the chippy paint hello sign. And this hello sign I got from the Dollar Tree. And the chippy paint idea is another TikTok idea. Do you see a trend here? I've been going down the TikTok rabbit hole. and But I'm telling you, they have all kinds of awesome ideas. The first thing I did to this hello sign was use my Waverly antiquing wax to give it a nice stain using the baby wipe method at first, but then I had to switch to a brush because the baby wipe just could not get in all the little loop-de-loops of the word. Now the chippy paint technique is done in layers and the first color I'm using is crystal from Waverly that I got at Walmart and the way that this effect is achieved is by rubbing a candle using the wax on your piece where you do not want the paint to stick. As a side note, I wish that I would have used more wax in more places. I kind of concentrated on the edges like I'm distressing you know like how my thought process is around the edges of things getting distressed but I think it would have been a lot better if I would have put that wax pretty much all over then paint your first color of paint onto your project and then let it dry but of course I used my hair dryer then you use packing tape clear packing tape to remove the paint that was where the candle was. And so I'm gonna show you this first with just using one color. So I've just got the blue down right now with no top coat. And when I rip this off, watch what happens. Voila, chippy paint. So I did this repeatedly with the same piece of packing tape until it wasn't tacky anymore. And then I would get a new piece and I did this all over my hello. So you could stop right here if you like that look, but I wanted to add another layer of chippy paint. And so I went over my whole word again with the candle and I painted on a really thick layer of white chalk paint. And I was thinking 
thicker might make it look like it's been painted more times like it was older and chippier and I, I really do like how that worked out and then putting the packing tape back down over that white paint and also you should try to burnish that tape down into the paint as much as you can so the it's like the harder that you scrape this down into the paint the more paint is going to come off with the tape so yeah that makes sense but isn't this absolutely so cute chippy paint instead of just painting on distressing you know which i like that too but this is such a new technique to me and i am loving it i wish you could see in better detail the blue showing through but because of the lighting you can't tell so much the difference between the blue and the white but imagine you could do all kinds of colors and have all kinds of different colors showing through that white paint making it look like it's been painted different colors throughout the years and it's just worn apart then ironically enough the places where i normally distress with a paintbrush <laughs> along the edges they were not distressed enough for me so i went back with my dollar tree scraper and scraped some of the paint off along the edges and then she was perfect isn't she just cute as pie Here's number seven. The inspiration for the first DIY came from Kirkland's. It's a long farmhouse sign and it came with a price tag of $60. I have this clearance poster frame from Walmart. It was only $4 that I think I can turn this into that farmhouse sign. And if you have ink and paper in your printer, then you can have a farmhouse sign. No one said that you had to use Cricut for everything, and I'm not gonna do it this time. <laughs> so I just went into Canva and printed out these letters, and I found the wreath, just Google Images, and that's what we're gonna use instead of vinyl. So then, of course, the first step is to remove all of the inside goodies from the poster frame. Be careful with the backing because that is what we're going to be turning into our wall art. That's what's going to get painted. And the insert with the fake people pictures, you don't need that. I'm gonna be painting this frame white. So I'm taping off the plexiglass. That's actually plexiglass and it could be removed but i went ahead and left it intact tape that off and then i painted the frame two coats of waverly white chalk paint now let the creativity begin using that same waverly white chalk paint i began painting the backing of the poster frame and you see I started going horizontally first which ordinarily I would do but I don't know something changed my mind and the way that it was going into the grooves of this cardboard and, and I liked how it was kind of I don't know looking kind of worn very farmhousey very rustic so I changed direction and started going in vertical strokes and I did this all the way down the cardboard and you can see where I left some places bare. So while the backing of the poster frame was drying, I cut out all of my letters, keeping to the black side, trying not to let any of the white paper show. Thank you. 
Once the backing was dry, then I used this kind of light brown marker that I had to draw shiplap lines. And I found the center, which was about six inches, and I always draw my middle line first. So I drew that all the way down the cardboard at six inches. And then for the other planks, I decided to make those uh, three inches. So then I measure out three inches from that center line and make a mark and draw my line on this side and I'll repeat it on the other side. The lines I just drew kind of serve as a guide more than anything because I'm gonna go back in with Waverly Truffle Brown Paint and being not so careful as to be perfectly straight because I feel like this piece is really haphazard in how it's coming together and I'm liking it and it's a lot of fun working this way. Once those rustic shiplap lines were completely dry, now I bring in all of my cutout letters and uh, do a fitting, an arranging, a making sure that they're spaced apart right and crossing fingers that they are the correct size. And again, I used Canva to make these letters. It's a free thing you can get on your phone and your desktop. I have it on both. And it's awesome for designing. I just picked a font and typed the letters. And you can see I, I could fit like two on one sheet of paper. It was really fast and simple. Then I used decoupage or Mod Podge. It's the same thing. I, I have a big bottle of decoupage glue. And that's what I'm using to glue down the letters. So first... I put a layer of the Mod Podge down and then I put the letter on top and tried to get it arranged. And be very careful because this is just paper and it will, once it gets wet with that Mod Podge, it will tear. So be very careful in where you lay them down first because it's not easy to take them back up and move them. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, please drop me a comment down below and remember to hit the subscribe button. I'm trying to grow this channel. I'm loving making these videos, so I would love it if you would hit that subscribe button and become part of my family. When everything is glued down, then go over the whole thing, letters and non-lettered parts as well, with your Mod Podge. You can see I'm kind of patting that decoupage on those letters and that's to try to minimize the bleeding from the ink. By now your frame should be dry and you can remove your tape. And finally the last step in this DIY is to assemble the final product. Of course, making sure all the Mod Podge is dry first and put your nice artwork back down inside and secure all the little clamps around the edge and he's ready to go up on the wall. So here's the final look and it only cost me $4. And even if you had to buy this poster frame at full price, it was only $15. So compare that to the 60 that Kirkland's wanted, this is a win. Number six is one of my favorite things in my house. I have always wanted some corbels in the corners of my doorway going from my living room to my kitchen, but they can be very pricey, especially the kind that I want. And they had these 
Corbels at the Dollar General store, $7 a set, and I thought I could put them together by two sets, so I got $14 in it, and put two of them together to make them nice and chunky like I want them to be. I used the Gorilla Glue hot glue sticks to stick the two corbels together. To make the two corbels look like it's one fat chunky corbel, I'm going to hide the seam using wallboard joint compound. You could use spackle and maybe caulk, maybe not caulk, but yeah, um, spackle or this wallboard compound worked really well. So I used a lot of this on the corbels because they don't exactly match up perfectly there was a little bit of a height difference you know so I had to put a lot of this joint compound on but it makes a very old world style texture if you like that look Next, you'll need to let your joint compound or spackle dry overnight and come back in and sand it to the smoothness that you want. Now, if you like the older style, you know, more beat up, worn look, then you won't need to sand as much, but I wanted mine pretty smooth. After you've sanded your corbels to the texture that you like, now it's time to paint them. I did two coats all over the corbels and I used a lot of paint. I was heavy handed with the paint because I wanted my corbels to look um, old and kind of plastery so I wanted my paint to be thick. And I had to use my small artist style paintbrushes to get in those little grooves and cracks. Now the distressing is what brings these corbels to life. This is the most fun. So I used different kinds of sandpaper. I used a sanding block. I used the sandpaper. I even used a nail file to get in some of the harder to sand places. And I did like worn out edges and I sanded down those brush stroke marks from the paintbrush. And here's the final product, $14 for the set. I'm so happy. I haven't hung them in the corners of my doorway just yet because I need to refresh the paint on my trim. But here they are looking so cute anyway. Number five is super sweet. The house shaped cutting board. And I thought and thought, you know, of course, obviously I could make this a house. Houses are so popular and I love them, but I came up with another idea. I'm not using the actual cutting board, the plastic part. I just wanted the wood part. And so I used pliers to remove the feet that were stapled on the bottom. So my idea was to make this a church since Easter is coming. And I had this scrap piece of wood that I had left over from other projects. It was already painted white and that's going to be the steeple. So I marked off the pointy end where the steeple will be. And then I ever so sweetly asked my husband if he would please take this down to the shed and cut this piece of wood for me. I thought it was really shaping up cute already. Now, the next thing is using this box from the Dollar Tree and I just need one of the wooden sides and I'm going to make a door and two windows. Actually, I need two sides of this box. That's right. I need both sides of the box that are solid and don't have the star cutouts. If you score a line in this thin wood, 
just keep digging a few times into it, it will snap apart. And then just cut off the jaggedy pieces that might be sticking out and sand the end. And doesn't that make just the cutest sinking door for the front of our church? Now the other cut end of that piece of wood will be one of the windows. And here I just use the same process as before to make the second window. Next, I used wood glue from the Dollar Tree and hot glue for the immediate hold to glue the steeple down. If you wanted to recreate this project using Dollar Tree items, they have houses at Dollar Tree and you could use one of their long wooden decorations for the steeple and make this exactly like I did. Next, I used Rust-Oleum chalked in linen white to paint the whole church. And honestly, I thought for a minute about leaving the house part of the church wooden. And I still think that that would have been a cute option too, but ultimately, no, I wanted my whole church to be white. Next, I had to decide what colors the door and windows should be, and I decided that I would use the Waverly Antique Wax and the Baby Wipe technique to make my wooden door. At first, I thought that I might would do the windows the same way as the door, but I was afraid that that might look like the windows were boarded up on my church, and I didn't want that. So I decided to use this gray chalk paint and I'm doing one coat of the chalk paint and then I go over it with a dry brush of the linen white to bring down that darkness of the gray paint. Then I used that white marker from the Dollar Tree to draw on some window panes. Then I thought the window needed some definition around the edge, so I used a regular black Sharpie just to go around the edges. Then I assembled my church using wood glue and hot glue to put the door and windows in place. And I drew a door handle on the door with my Sharpie marker. To make the details on the steeple, I'm using a brush set from the Dollar Tree and that gray chalk paint, which came from Michaels. I don't know that I mentioned that before. And I wanted there to be a round window at the top and I'm giving painting, hand painting, a whirl. I've never considered myself a very good painter, but I'm really gonna try hard to do more of it and maybe I'll get better. After I had the basics painted on, then I went back with that white marker to add the window panes in the round window and add some highlights to the cross. Then I thought it needed a little more detail, so I went back with my black Sharpie to add a touch of black onto the cross and to go around the round window.
And then I remembered I wanted that round window to match the bottom windows, so I kind of frosted that in with a dry brush of the linen white chalk paint. The last step to making this church was to take some sandpaper and distress around the edges, making it look so stinking cute. Number four is the most functional piece I ever made. I'm going to transform this red toolbox with the apple cutout into a bath caddy. And I'm going to need the help of some items from the Dollar Tree. And by items from the Dollar Tree, I mean the last Easter sign I have in my stash. I'm going to use the Easter sign to cover up the apple cutouts on the toolbox. So if you find a toolbox or something like a shelf or a cabinet that has those cutouts that you don't like and you want to update it, this is a great way to just cover those up easily. So what I have to do is remove the embellishments from the sign first. And then the back side of the sign is going to be the part that will be facing outward. Now we need to cut the sign down to fit what we want to cover up on the toolbox or your cabinet or a shelf, whatever you're covering. So I just used the toolbox as a template and I traced around it. Cutting these signs from the Dollar Tree is really simple. All you need to do is score it a few times with a really sharp utility knife or X-Acto knife and then it will snap in two. And if you have any leftover fragments on the end like this, just go back and trim those off with your knife. After I got it cut to the correct length, then I needed to cut it down to the correct height. So I traced a line again and cut it with my utility knife the same way as I did the other cut. Now the sign fits perfectly over the cutout apples and you would never even know that they were there. I used Dollar Tree wood glue and hot glue to secure the sign down in place. Fortunately, this is the only side of the toolbox that had the apple cutouts, so it's the only side that I need to cover up. Now the old 90s apples are completely covered up and she's ready for painting. And the side that I covered up is not going to be facing front. I'm using Rust-Oleum chalk paint in linen white to do a very rough coat of painting on this toolbox. So I don't want it to look completely smooth. As always, I want it to look a little aged. It doesn't need to be perfect. So I just threw two coats of paint on this toolbox. Also, I am going to be doing just a little bit of light distressing on the edges of this toolbox. And here is a, a tip that you'll need. If you don't want the original color of your piece showing through, like right here where I'm doing my sanding, some of the red is going to show through, but I was okay with that. If you don't like the color, then you're going to need to paint another color before you do your top coat of white. And honest to goodness, it was so easy to cover up those apples and put some paint on this toolbox and turn it into this really cute bath caddy. And I put my, my bath pillow in it and my scrubber and a nice little tied up bundle of washcloths. We're 
we're getting so close to that number one. Here's number three. In this one, I used the beloved Dollar Tree Farmer's Market calendar to make a pillow. I used one of my old couch pillows, a tablecloth from the Dollar General store I bought way back in the spring, but I loved the print on it, a mirrored printout of the Farmer's Market cover page of the calendar, which I'll tell you how I did, and Cricut Infusible ink. Some other things not pictured here is heat resistant tape, parchment paper, and a hot glue gun. Oh, and of course, an iron or easy press. And so this is how I made my mirrored image. I have a HP uh, printer that has a scanner. And so I cut down the cover of the calendar so that it would fit into this scanner. And I scanned the image into my computer and then I was able to mirror it, which turns it backwards. And then I printed it out in color, which I don't think that that matters if it's in color or black and white, if you don't have color ink, but I just went ahead and printed it out in color. And so that's how I got my image. And now I'm using the Cricut Infusible Ink markers to just color in all of the design, the colors that I wanted it to be. You don't have to stick with the colors that the calendar actually is. You can be creative and make it whatever colors you want, but I pretty much stuck to the colors that were already in the calendar. And so I just traced and filled in using the markers. And for the smaller lines, like the little tiny lines that are it, that's the boards of the barn in the image, I used a infusible ink pen. It has a much smaller tip, like a writing ink pen. The next step is to cut down the tablecloth to make the pillow cover. I cut the tablecloth into a really large rectangle and this is just where it was folded in half and I cut the square about the size of the pillow, a little larger than the pillow, and then folded it back over to make a cover. Once the tablecloth was cut down to fit around the pillow, then I turned it inside out and began to hot glue the edges. The easiest way I've found to hot glue edges together is to just run a bead of hot glue and fold it over. And in the finished project, you might have um, a little flappy do deal on the edges of your pillow, but I think that makes it kind of unique and Europe, like a European sham. It has like sort of a little piece that sticks out around the edge. And so because when you fold it over, there's actually two pieces of material there, you want to hot glue those two pieces together as well. Then open up the pillow cover and turn it right side out. And I wanted to do one final fitting, putting the pillow inside to make sure that the pillow cover was fitting the way that I wanted it to before I applied the design. The best part is coming up soon. Applying the design using this infusible ink 
is so satisfying. I'm telling you, I love these infusible ink markers. And they are so inexpensive, like $10 to $15 a box for all those colors. It's awesome. When you apply your, your design, you want to make sure that your material is free of wrinkles as much as possible and free of lint. So you want to lint roll, make sure there's no particles stuck on your design or your material. You need to put something inside your pillow cover to protect the ink from going all the way through to the back side. So I'm using a piece of cardstock, but you could use uh, whatever you can find, a piece of cardboard or a piece of a cereal box or something. Just place something down inside the middle of your pillow cover. Then place your design ink side down in the place that you want it centered in on the pillow cover and then use the heat resistant tape which I got mine it's the Cricut brand and I got mine at Walmart uh, use that heat resistant tape to tape your design down to hold it in place it's very important that your design stay in place while you're ironing it Next, use a piece of parchment paper to cover your design and this protects your iron from the ink. Your iron needs to be on its maximum hottest setting and then I press it straight down onto the design and hold it for 15 to 20 seconds and lift it straight back up and very carefully move it and straight back down in another spot. Now, if you have an easy press, you're gonna have a much better time getting this task accomplished, but I don't have an easy, easy press as of right now. It's on my list of things to get, but it works out anyway in the end. An iron is not the best way to go if you were making t-shirts or something like that because you'll see in the end it's it's not quite as what am I trying to say it's not quite as smooth a transfer as it would be with an easy press with an iron you get little blotches that don't transfer 100 percent but with this particular design and if you're wanting it to look a little faded, a little rustic anyway, it actually works in your favor to just go ahead and use an iron instead of an easy press. Then I take a little peek to see how the transferring is going and I see that it's just about where I want it to be. So I let it cool just a minute and then I remove the parchment paper and then I let it cool some more and remove the transfer tape and the paper. I was so happy with the results of using this infusible ink on this material and with this design, I thought it was perfect. The last thing to do is insert the pillow and close up that end seam. If you don't already have a pillow that you're not using to use as a form, you could of course just stuff it with pillow stuffing. I fold the edges inward to the inside of the pillow cover 
to make my faux hem. Once I get those folded inside, then I just hot glue it together. And that's it. That's how you use a calendar to make a pillow. Number two is the simplest, cutest. Using this paper that I found at a thrift store. And I'm not really for certain what this paper was made for. There's two sheets on this little pad and I got it for 25 cents. But I knew right away when I saw it in the thrift store, I wanted to frame it. And this is a frame I got on clearance at Hobby Lobby for $2.49. It didn't have any glass or anything with it. These are so easily found everywhere. I used my roller cutter from the Dollar Tree to cut a piece of this pad of pretty paper into the size that I needed. And, oh, I almost forgot. I did remove the top page to use for another project. So there's only one print and then the cardboard backing. Now the frame I wanted to be white so I painted it two good coats of Rust-Oleum Linen White. As always I used my hair dryer to speed up the drying time and then I used 120 grit sandpaper to distress the edges and the inside edges of this frame and this was another one that sanded it just distressed so pretty. I'm so happy with these projects today. Making sure that the print was all looking nice on the front side, I flipped it over and I got out my heavy duty staple gun and I stapled one in each corner, one on each end, and two on each long side. And I think this is perfect for a neutral farmhouse spring decoration. Now, if you wanted to hang it on the wall, you could either add a hanger to the back using jute string, or you could do like I'm going to do and just use command strips. And here it is, the number one favorite farmhouse DIY project I've made yet on my channel. And it is this cabinet that I made over from a flea market. This was just an $8 cabinet and I transformed it. I knew exactly what I wanted to do with this cabinet the minute I laid eyes on it. I envisioned it, of course, painted white and I wanted to put a wire front. And I've used this hardware cloth before on some cabinets in my kitchen and I like it even better than chicken wire. When you buy things from a flea market or a junk store, usually they're going to have a good layer of dust and sometimes filthy yuck. So the first thing I did was spray it down and wipe it off real good. Then I removed the hardware, which was just two hinges 
and one knob on the door. Then I painted the whole thing with two coats of the Rust-Oleum Linen White Chalk Paint. Then I opened up the hardware cloth and rolled it out to cut out a piece that would fit inside of the door. I used my wire cutters to just cut this piece out and a little word or a tip, I guess, would be try to flatten this out as best you can before you attach it to the door because I thought that I was getting mine pretty stretched out, but in the end, I've got a little bit of waviness going on, so try to flatten it as best you can. And then I used my heavy duty stapler to staple all around the edges on the inside lip of the door. My whole life, I felt like there had to be something more. And then I saw you. Then I wanted to do a little faux painting on the hardware. So the first thing I did was use my black chalk paint and I coated the hardware in the black first. And when the black was dry, then I coated it in white. And I did it sort of haphazardly. I wasn't trying to cover every little piece of black on the hardware. I wanted some of it to show through. And when the white layer was dry, I went back with a wet washcloth and did some wet distressing. And that is just where the wet washcloth takes away some of the paint that you just painted on, letting the bottom layer show through. And I think that this makes the hardware look even more old and worn and interesting. Then it's time to reattach all of the hardware. It's kind of hard to get anything done with a kitty cat up on your work table trying to boop your hand every five seconds. But I wouldn't trade him for the world. He's my little buddy. Now the screws on the hardware, on the hinges anyway, they are kind of a brass color. They look black here. And if they had been black, I might would have left them, but they're kind of brass. So I covered those up with some little dabs of white chalk paint. And for this piece, instead of using sandpaper, I am distressing using a wet paper towel. So the wet distressing method and i love it for this piece when you wet distress on something that's wood and you're using you've got white chalk paint or any kind of chalk paint on it that chalk paint dissolves a little bit with the water and kind of blends into the wood so you don't have a harsh stark like sanded off piece you have sort of little spots that look whitewashed and i'm loving it for this cabinet I am over the moon at how this cabinet turned out. 
I don't have it hung on my wall just yet, but I'm using it to display my collection of milk jars and cute little juice glasses. And there it is, my top 12. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, give me a comment down below and let me know you made it. Let me know if you agree. Is that your favorite one or do you have a number one that's your favorite? Thanks for watching everyone and I'll see you next time. Bye!